It is a challenge unprecedented in human history to feed 22% of the world's population with only 7% of the world's cultivated land. What's the secret behind the China's successful establishment of food security? 30 million tons, which can feed 80 million people. Let's get to work then. We are going to find out how the world's most populous country feeds its people. We have to get the wheat harvested. It is a huge project, far more complex and arduous than most can imagine. For thousands of years, the Chinese people have been working wonders with their diligence and wisdom. This is the Yuanyang County set deep in the Ailao Mountains of China's Yunnan province. In May, Bai Wanfu begins the year's most important task, planting rice seedlings. The village elders said, our people have been bending down like this to plant rice seedlings since our ancestors. Bai Wanfu's ancestors moved here about 1,300 years ago. To grow more food, they terrace the wild mountain slopes. A slope that climbs 2,000 meters can be cut into 3,700 terraces at the very most. Yuanyang County has over 11,000 hectares of terraced land an ancient Chinese mega-project to provide food for the population. Bay's family work. About one quarter of a hectare of rice paddies. The locals support themselves by farming. Using methods which date back thousands of years Today, China has to feed 1.38 billion people. The huge demand of food requires for new farming methods to complement the old. Four thousand kilometers away from the honey terraces, Farmers in northeastern China strive for the efficient over the picturesque. July is the busiest time of the year. For farm manager Liu Bao, her oversees 33,000 hectares of rice paddies. In July, the fields need to be checked every day. At this time of year, we worry about the neck blast the most. The stalks rot at the neck, and the transport of nutrients is cut off, and the whole plant dies for lack of nutrition. If it occurs, the effect can be disastrous. As neck blast spreads quickly and is difficult to cure, the rice farmers have to take preventive measures. The best time to do this is 10 days for Liu Bao. This means he has just 10 days to protect his 33,000 hectares of rice from fatal disease. Hurry up! How's it going? All going well. Let's get to work then. Pai 
pilot Liu Guoqi has been crop spraying for more than 20 years. Today, he will start to spray pesticides over the farm's 33,000 hectares of rice paddies. Flying a crop sprayer is also called hedge hopping. Operating a crop sprayer, also called hedge hopping, entails flying at exceptionally low heights, just skimming the ground. Usually we spray the pesticides from 5 meter to 7 meter above ground. This is to make sure pesticides attach to crops' leaves, so that they are effectively absorbed. If we are too high above ground, the pesticides will be dispersed by the wind. Low altitude flight is a big challenge. To a pilot's flying skills, low altitude is challenging. We are only five minutes above the ground, flying at a speed of 240 kilometers per hour. In the blink of an eye, an obstacle may appear and strike the aircraft. Liu Guoqi can cover more than 100 hectares of fields per flight, and up to 3,300 hectares per day. Although aerial spraying is very efficient, farm workers still need to work as fast as possible because they are facing an unpredictable enemy. Unpredictable weather is the biggest threat to aerial spraying. If it rains within a couple of hours of spraying, the pesticides will be washed away Strong winds can carry the spray droplets away from their target. To guarantee the right result, Newport has to wait for a stable weather window. My father came to northeast China from Shandong province. When he was 15 years old in 1963, many retired military personnel also moved here about that time. Bao's farm is on land once known as the Great Northern Wilderness. Today, it is called the largest granary in China. Since the 1950s, more than one million people have moved here. They came with a single shared purpose, to reclaim the land and feed the nation. You have 3,300 hectares there. Yesterday's rainfall caused a minor delay, putting us a tad behind our planned schedule. We'll catch up today. This is Liu Guoqi's flight path for the operation. It will take over 300 flights to cover all 33,000 hectares. His feet will rarely touch the ground through the spring season. This is just the life of one pilot. During the critical blast prevention period, more than 40 crop squares will be working the skies over the 13 million hectares of cultivated land. This is 15 times larger than the land area of Hong Kong. The annual harvest is enough to feed 100 million people. China's largest granary is vast, but it is only one small part of China. China encompasses a huge expanse of territory, but only 10% of the land is suitable for farming. China has less than one-tenth of a hectare of agricultural land per head of population. This means it has to feed 22% of the world's population. With only 7% of the world's arable land, it is a challenge unprecedented in the history of mankind. The task might have seemed impossible. But for one man's invention, It is a face familiar to every Chinese person. His name is as famous as the techniques he invented to grow rice. Yuan Longping 
is known through China as the father of hybrid rice. At the age of 87, he has come to Qingdao especially to test the characteristics of a new strain of rice. Rice is the staple food of over 800 million Chinese. In the 1960s, the average yield of rice was only 15 tons per hectare. The yield became the key problem of feeding more people. In 1960, Yuan Longping, a teacher at an agricultural school in Hunan province, began working on hybrid rice technology. 15 years on his work had tripled the yield per hectare to 45 tons. Improvement in planting techniques further increased agricultural efficiency. By their own effort, Chinese people made a difference to the nation's ability to feed itself. Today, Yuan Longping kept on improving his hybrid rice strains, and the third generation of super hybrid rice can yield up to 15 tons per hectare. This is not a blind pursuit of yield. By 2030, the Chinese population will peak at 1.45 billion, which means China has to prepare for another 100 million mouths to feed. As China is simultaneously undergoing the world's largest move to urbanization, land is becoming an increasingly precious resource. As far as land is concerned, China has to produce maximum amount of food from what is available. Qingdao is one of China's eastern coastal cities, this was once a coastal beach. Now it is a rice paddy. Unlike other rice paddies, the rice here is irrigated with desalinated seawater. And so is known as sea rice. Now the reading is zero. We put it in, and then the reading changed. 67 is the salinity of the soil's surface water. The sea rice is actually saline alkaline tolerant rice. It can grow on a salinized land or coastal beaches. Crops could not grow in such highly salinized soil anywhere in the world. But the Chinese have made the impossible possible. The father of hybrid rice leads the sea rice project he has come to Qingdao to test the rice characteristics during its heading period. Our goal is to promote the plantation of sea rice on 6.67 million hectares of land across China by 2020. It should yield 30 million tonnes of rice per year, which can feed 80 million people. China has about 100 million hectares of saline alkali soil, of which more than 13.3 million hectares are suitable for the cultivation of sea rice. The world has about 14 billion hectares of saline alkali soil. This Chinese technology provides a new solution to global hunger. These two and a half hectares of rice paddy may look quite ordinary, but it is in fact a miracle in agricultural production. Rice is growing in places where it had been deemed impossible. In towns and cities across the nation, the supermarkets are rarely quiet. What people buy most in supermarkets is all kinds of food. China consumes 18,000 tons of eggs, 100,000 tons of pork, and 200,000 tons of fruit every day. Sales of food in the supermarkets reflect people's dietary structure. No matter what, vegetables always claim an important place on Chinese dining tables. In China, when people are going to buy food, they always say they are going to buy vegetables. Grain and vegetables are the most important components of three meals a day. It is estimated that each individual in China consumes 10 times their weight in vegetables each year. China has a population of close to 1.4 billion. The demand for vegetables is relentless and insatiable. At Yuzhong County in Gansu province, 
Vegetable farmer Niu Shuegang is planting out cauliflowers in his field. The area where Niu Shuegang lives is high up and chilly. It has lots of sunshine, but the temperature range between day and night is extreme. The region is ideal for growing top quality vegetables. However, rainfall is less than abundant at 400 millimeters per year, cause serious water shortage here. Look at this place. There is no pollution. There's nothing like a factory anywhere near. It is nice and cool, but it is short of water. The need for food will not be reduced by unfavorable geographical conditions. To meet adverse geographical conditions, many irrigation projects have been built since the 1940s to boost production. The local farmland has been irrigated by water from the Yellow River. In order to grow more crops on the land in the mountains, local growers also found a new way to grow more vegetables. This double ridge and triple trench method has been developed for vegetable growing in arid areas. Look, here are two ridges and three trenches. If it rains, the water percolates through small holes in the plastic film and sinks into the ground. After covered with plastic films, water loss through evaporation greatly reduces. The thin layer of plastic film solves the shortage of water when planting vegetables. The plastic film has been laid in place. The newly planted seedlings need a good watering to increase their chances of survival. When the sun rises and the evaporation increases, the soil will stay adequately moist beneath the film. When the night falls and the temperature drops, the plastic film helps keep the soil warm. The simple plastic film has changed the appearance of the entire region. In addition to the southern mountains, the arid Lost Plateau to the north has also become a haven for vegetable production. Niu Shuigong has planted his last crop of cauliflower for the year. The baby Chinese cabbages are already for harvest. In June, summer vegetables appear in the markets on the Lanzhou Plateau. The summer often sees vegetable shortages in southern China because of extreme weather and flooding brought on by typhoons. Southern China is then the biggest market for vegetables produced in Gansu's Yuzhong County. I can sell 100 tons of vegetables a day. The refrigeration house sells about 600 tons a day. The plateau continues to supply summer vegetables until November. By November, the average temperature across northern China has already dropped to 5 degrees Celsius. Thereafter, as winter begins to set in, it becomes impractical to grow vegetables. The vegetables then have to be brought from south China to the north. Transportation increases the cost. But there is one other option. We get up on time at 4 a.m. and begin to pick vegetables. Otherwise, the vegetables may go bad before they reach the destination. Li Tuanwei is a vegetable farmer from Shuguang City in East China. He mainly plants tomatoes. It is early May. Most tomato plants grow in northern China are still immature. Li already has ripe tomatoes because he has adopted a winter greenhouse planting technology. The greenhouse has a simple structure. The curved roof is supported by steel pipes and cement columns. Both ends are walled off with plastic films stuffed with insulating material. With these simple materials, the temperature inside can reach 35 degrees Celsius even in winter. With the help of the greenhouses, Lee can grow vegetables three seasons a year. Not all greenhouses are such simple structures. In the new intelligent greenhouse in Shouguang City, it takes only one technician to manage. The whole 8,000 square meter complex with advanced hydroponics, crops are no longer planted in the dirt. 
Although the greenhouse relies on high-tech solutions, there is still one vital area in which nature is required to lend a helping hand. Here are our bumblebees. A single bee can pollinate 2,000 flowers per day. Four boxes of bees are enough for the whole greenhouse. Tomatoes pollinated by bumblebees are not affected by hormones and have good shape. For agriculture, the optimum solution combines technology and nature. Today, Shuguang City has 40,000 hectares of vegetable greenhouses with an annual output of 45 million tons of vegetables, which supplied the North Chinese market during the winter months. milk for as long as they have had domesticated cattle. Milk is rich in calcium vitamins and all the amino acids required for human growth. According to the report published by National Bureau of Statistics over the last 20 years, China's milk consumption has increased by sixfold. China is the world's fastest growing consumer. At Bengbu City in southeast China, 6,700 hectares of alfalfa are ready for the first harvest of the year. Alfalfa is a top quality feed for grazing animals. Once its use was restricted to highly valued horses, now it is being a slaughter for another kind of animal altogether. Five kilometers away is a large modern ranch, which raises more than 40,000 cows. It is the largest dairy farm in China. The fresh alfalfa will be delivered here. After being pressed and fermented, it becomes a nutritious feed, which not only provides the protein needed by a cow, but will also greatly improve its milk yield. Just like people who eat well have energy, a high quality feed is what guarantees milk yield and the health of the cows. Equally, keeping the cows happy overall is an important factor. It may look painful, but in fact, the cows enjoy it much. Hoof trimming is to remove the extra cuticle. It makes the pressure even between the two toes. The cows will feel more comfortable when they walk. Every cow needs hoof trimming at least two times a year. If they are not hoof trimmed in time, some cows will be limping. In those cases, they produce less milk. Like the human fingernails, cow's hoof nails is a kind of cuticle. Our nails grow about three millimeters per month. And cow's nails grow almost five millimeters every month. We are like manicurists to the cows. Great efforts are made to create a more comfortable life for the cows. After that, the cows need to go to work. diameter rotating milking machines are the heart of the dairy. Driven by a hydraulic pump, the operators work efficiently around the outside of the turntable. The giant milker can handle 80 cows at a time. The teat cup affixes, and just like that, the milk flows into the pipe. Through the cup. 
It simulates the mouth of a calf. And then the milk goes through a cooler before it is stored. When the milking finishes, the cup comes off automatically. The machine completes a full rotation every 10 minutes. It can milk nearly 500 cows in an hour. The entire ranch's daily output is over 600 tons of milk. That's enough for the daily consumption of 20 million people. The numbers are rapidly changing. Statistics show that the consumption of dairy products increases by 0.8% of individual income, increased by 1%. The changes are driven by a new dietary structure of the Chinese people. Like eggs, meat and vegetables, milk has become an important part of the basic diet. Fresh prawns on a special offer. With the improvement in refrigeration techniques, various types of aquatic products now appear regularly in big supermarkets. Foodstuffs that were once luxuries are becoming everyday fare. Fresh prawns on sale. It's June, and Zhang Jiawei is about to set sail into the Gulf of Laizhou. China has a very long eastern coastline to better conserve coastal fisheries. The four-month closed season of fishing starts at the beginning of May. With catches decreasing, the country is experimenting with new ways to cultivate seafood. The elder generation basically lived on fishing. Now the fishery resources have become very limited. The fish breeding industry is thriving. They breed all kinds of aquatic products like fish, scallops, sea cucumbers. This time, Zhang Jiawei is going to install these metal cages. The 10 meter wide net cages are not used to catch fish, but to farm them. We should first fix the frames in the north. Ten net cages form a group. They are fixed with 28 anchors on the seabed. There is a mooring system underneath. An anchor weighs about 480 kg. The chains weigh 50 kg. They are connected by cables. In this way, the frames and chains. Thus, with this method, the frames and chains under sea can be firmly fixed. And then we have to fix everything together. After a frame is fixed in place, the net will be attached to it. The net extends eight meters beneath the sea surface, creating a 750 cubic meter underwater cage. When the weather is suitable, fish fry will be placed in the cage. Fish proteins have a similar composition to human proteins. It is a good way for mankind to obtain protein. China is the only country in the world which breeds more fish than catches it. In 2014, the annual output of aquatic products in China reached 69 million tons. These white-roofed coastal workshops are land-based breeding farms. Each unit has 50 tanks. Each tank is 8 meters in diameter and 8 meters in depth. The tanks are filled with purified seawater. Liquid oxygen is pumped into the water to maintain oxygen levels and provide ideal breeding conditions for the fish. Each tank can sustain over 1.6 tons of fish fry. As the ocean temperature rises in June, fish fry from the land-based facilities will be released back to the sea.
to fixing the 200 net cages, Zhang Jiawei and his crew can release the fish. The volume of each net cage is 750 square meters. One cubic meter of water can support 20 kilo of fish at most. Now we advocate the idea of ecological aquaculture, so the breeding density is very low. This method significantly improves the meat quality of fish, because it's always swimming. We raise them in seawater with rich dissolved oxygen and a variety of microbes. A lot of small fish and shrimps swim into the cages, so the fish can also feed on their own. The cage measures two centimeters across, which keeps the fish secure, while allowing the seawater to flow through and take away the waste products. It attempts to balance natural ecology with marine aquaculture. Today, while China is able to feed its 1.4 billion people, it is also constantly looking for more nutritious and healthier foodstuffs. Innovative technologies are constantly changing traditional farming methods. Even a minor adjustment can lead to unexpected changes for a whole industry. July is the hottest month in Korla of Xinjiang in China's far west. It is also the peak season for a variety of crop diseases and pests. This farmer is very anxious right now. They want to spray pesticide tonight. Ai Hai Peng and his pest control team set out again. If you don't mind the mosquitoes, you go ahead. Korla is on the vast plains south of the Tian Shan Mountains since 2016. Under China's new land policy, large tracts of arable land here are contracted to individuals which creates benefits of scale in agricultural operations. The new production methods make new demands on agricultural services. These young men, almost all under 25, call themselves new farmers. They use unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. The equipment is radio controlled and run by their own program. The new farmers use drones to spray pesticides on the crops. Past, people used canisters, tractors or pipes to spray. You have to lift the spraying devices above head height to spray sunflowers. This means the pesticides can fall on the spraying personnel with an unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. This isn't an issue. The drone is over a metre across and weighs 70 kilograms. They can fly just one metre above the crops. High-speed centrifugal nozzles atomize the liquid pesticide, which the airflow from the propellers then drives down onto the crops. The use of drones is becoming more and more widespread in China's agriculture as the nation's aeronautics and space industries develop. Satellite navigation technology allows many UAVs to operate autonomously and precisely. High precision means if it is necessary, this drone can spray pesticide around a certain crop. With the real-time kinematic technology, it can operate within a few centimeters because it flies above the field. It sprays the whole crop while avoiding double dosing. Ai Hai Peng loads another canister of pesticide into the drone. And the 
the software takes care of the rest. Each machine can cover four hectares of fields per hour and only uses 12 liters of pesticides per hectare. This method of spraying has reduced pesticide consumption by 30%. It also greatly reduces pesticide residue on the crops, then reduces overall water consumption by 90%. key in insect control. Ai Haipeng and his team literally need to work day and night. We operate in the evening because it is too hot in the daytime. The particles are so small that they evaporate very easily. If it's windy, the particles will be blown away. The other reason is that insects are more active in the evening. We catch more insects if we spray in the evening, so the effect of the treatment is better. With the accuracy brought by satellite navigation, the drones are to operate smoothly even in the dark. This UAV technology is not only applied in crop protection, but also for the confirmation of land rights and crop surveillance in general. Today, a variety of previously labor-intensive agricultural services can be booked by a phone call or the click of a mouse. These new agricultural service models are steering a new agricultural revolution. Zhang Gengyun has a doctorate in plant breeding and dynamics, focused on the application of biotechnology to improve crop breeding. In a laboratory in Shenzhen, his research team is conducting genetic tests on millet. As you can see, this is our sequencing workshop. We sample the leaves or a bit of corresponding tissues in the seedling stage. We can determine its genomic structure very quickly. Seed quality is crucial for plants, and each species has a unique genetic sequence, which determines the plant's characteristics. Dr. Zhang's job is to mark out these characteristics to identify a plant's genome means to decipher its life code and growth pattern. Many people consider genes mysterious. In fact, genes are just DNA sequences. This is the genome map of millet produced. By sequencing, observe how, for the millet, it possesses a total of nine chromosomes. Each gene is a specific fragment on one of the chromosomes this is a sequence on chromosome 4. So through sequencing, we can see this part controls the efficiency of photosynthesis. It determines the yield. We can use this technique, not just in the millet, but also other crops and other species. Through sequencing, we can quickly decipher a plant's growth pattern. Since the beginning of agricultural society, plant breeding has been an eternal theme. Seeds are not only the foundation of agricultural production, but also the primary element to ensure crops quality and yield. China, however, is experiencing a crisis in its seed industry. From 2000 to 2010, imports of high quality seeds increased by nearly fivefold. Dr. Zhang and his team are dedicated to reversing that trend through biotechnology. In the past, traditional plant breeding experts cannot know the yield of their seeds until the plants are mature. 
With this sequencing technology, we know the performance of the seeds while the plants are still seedlings. So it will actually improve the efficiency of plant breeding by 100 or even 1,000 times. Genome of two-thirds of the world's agricultural species have been deciphered in the institution where Dr. Zhang works. This means that Zhang's team has a clear idea of how to produce better seeds. Today's breeding procedures are more accurate and controllable. This is the largest gene bank in the world, with living biological samples from 300,000 species, millions of animals, and tens of millions of microorganisms. Here we do long-term cold storage at a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius. The core purpose of the National Gene Pool is to store biological information resources and data resources. It is of extraordinary value to biological studies, the biotechnology industry and other related activities. In 2011, Dr. Zhang team completed the sequencing of the rice genome and drew the first high-density genetic map. They have altered the leaf color of sterile millet from yellow-green to dark green, enhancing the efficiency of its photosynthesis and thereby increasing its yield by over 20%. It is the first example of where genome mapping has successfully contributed to the improvement of plant performance. It is causing a revolution in the breeding of minor crops and indicates how science and technology will change the future face of agriculture. Mr. Zhao, let everyone know. We are having a meeting There will be heavy rain on the 4th and 5th. We have to get the wheat harvested by the night of the 3rd. From yesterday's cloud map, the clouds have already reached Henan province. Now they're already high above our heads. According to the plan, four operational groups will work in two shifts. Cigarettes! and lighters are forbidden. Everyone must follow the lead. This farm is in central China. The wheat harvest begins today. Hot air rising from the ground and taking moisture into the upper atmosphere threatens to bring heavy rain and thunderstorms. Du Tong and his team only have two days to harvest 870 hectares of crops. Heavy rain is forecasted on the 4th and 5th. The ground will be very muddy and vehicles will get bogged down. If we don't get it in now, the wheat will rot in the fields. To ensure a smooth and fast running operation, the farm will use 37 large harvesters. Each harvester takes 1.5 tons of grains. From previous experience, the most efficient way is to have two harvesters work through the same block. The land here along the Yellow River was developed for arable use. In the late 1950s, today it provides high quality wheat and wheat seed for China's central plains. Of all crops in the world, wheat has the largest planted area, the highest yield, and the widest distribution. It accounts for one-third of the world's total grain output. China is the world's largest wheat grower.
90 kilometers away, the rain has already started falling. It is due here in 20 hours. Dutong's team now needs to work non-stop to get the job done. The only thing left is this small block, and a small area from the big block. We have basically completed our task. Dutong's team has completed their task. Heavy rain arrives on schedule. The parched land now is thirsty for the promised rain. However, technology advanced, we've become, we are still bound by the cycle of nature, starting sometime in June. 24 million hectares of wheat fields will be harvested across China. As one of China's most important grain, over 120 million tons of wheat will be yielded. The agricultural cycle continues from sowing to harvest. Crops grow and mature. As the seasons come and go, China's gargantuan food supply system runs in its never-ending cycle, feeding its people of 1.4 billion. Balancing the seemingly impossible 7% to 22% equation through diligence and wisdom, 